Hello, and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing a video which is based on a blog post I published on the 13th of April, 2021, called Auguste Rodin's The Kiss. And this was part of my um, blogging from A to Z April that year because it was um, Dante's 700th um, Dark Side Death Anniversary, and this was like a great letter for Kay, and this is also going to be the start of a mini-series about like artwork inspired by Dante and the Divine Comedy or artwork about Dante and Beatrice. I'm really looking forward to turning these blog posts into videos, and so uh, many people are familiar with this um, famous um, statue. So, Auguste Rodin's famous 1882 marble sculpture, Le Basser, The Kiss, was originally entitled Francesca da Rimini, and depicts Francesca and her lover Paola Malatesta. Paola was Francesca's brother-in-law. Their story is one of the most well-known in the Divine Comedy in Canto V of Inferno, who's been you know, depicted so many times in all sorts of different like art, music, even um, ice skating programs, as I'll mention at the end. Francesca, born 1255, was the daughter of Guido da Polenta I, Lord of Ravenna. Around 1275, she married Giovanni Malatesta, whose father Malatesta da Verrucchio was Lord of Rimini. Though Giovanni had been born with a physical deformity causing a limp, he nevertheless bravely fought in several battles. Their marriage was a political alliance designed to end their family feud, which unfortunately that was pretty much a fact of life for like pretty much like most of human history until very, very recently. You know, medieval Italy was no exception. Like it was, you were very, very lucky and rare if you were able to marry for love. Like most of the time it was just like for family or political alliances or like or trying to get like a better match for your daughter so she could, you know, have a more financially comfortable lifestyle. Francesca fell in love with her brother-in-law, Paolo, one year younger than Giovanni, or at least the, according to the sources I saw, it's kind of like hard in many cases to pin down exactly what, what year, particularly like what date and month per people were born within the Middle Ages, because we, we, they just didn't keep records as carefully and like, you know, consistently as they do today. Like, for example, like birth certificates, that wasn't really a thing at all. So in some cases, we just basically have to like guess based on context clues, unless this person specifically said, like, I was born in, you know, like, December 10th, like, 1280 or whatever. Though Paolo was married too, they began an affair, which lasted an entire decade. Tragedy stuck when Giovanni caught them being amorous in Francesca's bedroom sometime between 1283 to 86 and murdered both of them with his bare hands. Instead of being arrested and sentenced to death himself for such a cruel crime, Giovanni went on to become a five-time podesta in Pissarro. He held that position until his 1304 death and unfortunately not much has changed like you'd be like surprised if you heard all these cases where like men like so-called men like murder their wives or their girlfriends and the judge lets them off because oh he was just temporary insanity or he was under a lot of stress or it was just like rough sex gone wrong oh she wanted to be choked to the point of blacking out it's just like so horrible and this is one of many reasons why I'm a second wave feminist you know like women as a sex class we still don't have you know a lot of rights many people just don't realize we haven't come really that far since the Middle Ages, although obviously we have much more rights than women in those days. Dante and Virgil meet the lovers in the second circle of hell, the first um, proper circle of hell after um, Limbo, which isn't really like full of torments at all, occupied by the lustful. The couple are trapped in a perpetual whirlwind, eternally swept through the air because they let themselves be swept away by their illicit passion. And this is one of many examples throughout the entire um, Divine Comedy of Contrapasso, which I did a video about some time back, you can find it in my um, playlist, I'm all about Dante and the Divine Comedy, about, I'm all about Contrapasso, part one, Inferno, and I'm still planning to do a, a blog post and a video about um, part two, which is how Contrapasso works in Purgatory, and so like in essence, it's whatever the person did in life, you know, they're reminded of it eternally by their like form of penance or their form of punishment, like the above mentioned, the lustful are swept around by a wind because they just couldn't control their passions in life. Dante calls to them, and they come to a brief pause while Francesca vaguely provides a few details about herself. Since their affair was so well known, and they were Dante's contemporaries, he correctly states Francesca's name. Dante asks why they're being tortured like this, and their story so moves him, he faints. And many people like kind of laugh about this, like, oh, whenever he wants to cop out, he like can't figure out how to write about something or like do a transitional like phrase or whatever or like a you know, section stanza between like this scene and that scene oh he just passes out or goes to sleep that's so convenient but you know many people believe because he had such like, realistic descriptions in both like the this um poem the divine comedy and also in um levita nuova his um, autobiographical work about his love for beatrice and i made possibly a few other things like you know fainting like almost fainting a few times and coming back to himself they're just so realistic they can't just be like oh he wanted to cop out of writing about her he like couldn't figure out how to do it or whatever he just didn't 
feel like that they believe he might have had an epilepsy or a condition very similar to it. And as I mentioned in a previous video in some blog posts in my um, alternative history, um, I attribute this like, you know, fainting in response to extremely stressful or emotional things. He has um, meningitis and measles like back to back, like very long, serious illnesses during the summer of 1274 and ever after he's like left with like, you know, this proclivity towards fainting. And that's definitely a well-known side effect of like measles um, encephalitis and um, meningitis. You know, these people often frequently do unfortunately have like some kind of seizure afterwards. And so that was like the best way I could figure out to like, you know, attribute it to it. That would be plausible and make sense. Rodin's sculpture was originally part of a group of reliefs decorating his massive bronze panel, The Gates of Hell, La Corte de l'Enfer, which was commissioned in 1880 by the Directorate of Fine Arts. Its delivery date was set for 1885, but the Decorative Arts Museum it was intended for was never built. You know, unfortunately, that's a fact of life sometimes in the museum world. Like, you're really, really gung-ho about planning a museum, really looking forward to, like, its opening and visiting it, but sometimes it just, you know, doesn't come to pass for, like, you know, reasons of finance or people just to lose interest or whatever. But not one to let a good idea go to waste. Rodin worked on this bronze panel on and off for 37 years until his 1917 death. Like, you think you're, like, spending a way too much time, like, writing your work in progress or doing your painting. Like, wow, like, 37 years? I can't, well, imagine almost, like, writing, like, one solid book, maybe, like, different volumes, like, a very, very deliberately long book with, you know, like, a 12 volumes or whatever, or, like, a long series of paintings. But, like, just one specific work and, like, a single volume of a book or like just like a single piece of artwork like wow that's like absolute you know dedication like taking magnum opus to new levels prior to the commission rodin a fellow dante file had made some sketches of divine comedy characters for potential future artworks late in life rodin donated his sculpture and drawings along with reproduction rights to the french government two years after his death in 1919 the Hotel du Rhône, where he'd worked on the panel, became the Musée Rodin. And I do apologize if I'm inadvertently mispronouncing any of the French names. That's a language I um, read uh, much better than I speak. Rodin made large sculptures with the help of assistants who copied smaller models, made of materials easier to work with than marble. When they were done, Rodin made finishing touches to the full-size master sculpture. For this sculpture, he made small-scale models in plaster, bronze, and terracotta, and I believe that was kind of his um, modus operandi, like, you know, making smaller models before, like, doing the grand final masterpiece, and that does make sense if you're doing sculpture. That's just not a thing I ever remember doing in any of my art classes or on my own over the years. I've always been, you know, like, painting and drawing. When people first saw the sculpture in 1887, they suggested the less specific name, Les Bessers, The Kiss. The French government ordered the first large-scale marble version to go on display at the 1889 Exposition Universelle, but it didn't come to pass. The sculpture's first public display was delayed till 1898 in the Salon de la Société des Beaux Arts. So popular was it that the Barbidian Company offered Rodin a contract to make a limited supply of smaller bronze versions. In 1900, the sculpture went to the Musée de Luxembourg and was taken to its current home, the Musée Rodin, in 1918. Unusual for the era, Rodin sculpted his women as full, equal, receptive partners in romantic and erotic acts, not submissive, passive puppets with dominant men. Because of the sculpture's overt eroticism, it was very controversial. A bronze version was refused public display at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, popularly called the Chicago World's Fair, and hidden in an inner chamber accessible only after personal application. If you saw my recent video about um, the book by Amy Son, the Man Who Hated Women by Anthony, I mean, um, about Anthony Comstock, one of his big things was like, he, he was so outraged by that belly dancing, the danse de ventre at the World's um, Fair in 1893. He was just like, oh, this is like, you know, miming sexual stuff. Like, I wonder if he knew about this sculpture and was like also outraged about that, but he couldn't do anything about that because it had like, a, a, to my knowledge, at least nothing to do with like being sent through the mail or information about it, like being sent through the post office. Paolo has an erection in the original life-size sculpture, which made it even more controversial. Like, that was something like Mr. Comstock. He would have been apoplectic about if he had seen that. Francesca and Paolo have been depicted in countless paintings, sculptures, operas, plays, songs, symphonic poems, and other works of art and music over the centuries. And I will be featuring a few of them in my upcoming videos about um, artwork of the Divine Comedy. It's obviously, like, way too numerous to list here, but as I mentioned, like, it was also, um, at least one to my knowledge, um, figure skating program from, um, 1994, the, um, famous, um, pair skaters, um, two-time Olympic gold medal medalist, um, Yekaterina Gordieva and, um, Sergei Grinkov, un unfortunately, um, Sergei passed away in November of 
1995 at the age of only 28. But anyway, they had this beautiful program. I believe it was after their second Olympic gold medal win in 1994. It was like based after the kiss. They were like basically like skating to the role of like sculptures, like statues come to life and doing different poses of it. And like the, the ending pose is like, you know, particularly like very statue-like and erotic. They had many very, you know, romantic programs. And I'll leave a link to it below. You know, they're like some of my favorite pair skaters. And like some point in future, I am hoping to do a, a blog post and a video about her um, memoir, My Sergei, which she wrote after she was um, tragically widowed at the age of only 24. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry if the lighting wasn't so good. There's like fading natural light at this time of day. And I, if you haven't already, um, please um, subscribe. And I always love seeing comments from these guys. Um, please um, let me know if you are familiar with this sculpture, if you knew about its connection to Dante and the Divine Comedy, if you're familiar with or you like any other artwork based on the poem or his life in general. I'm really looking forward to doing these um, future videos about like Dante and artwork and such. And so I'll um, see you guys again very soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.